What's the most important thing you've learned in life so far? There is something called the serenity trick where it says, grant me the courage to change the things I can, the ability to accept the things I can't, and the wisdom to know the difference. And there's two things in that. One, I think the wisdom to know the difference is the lifelong learning. And the biggest learning I had to learn, it's actually a book by Dr. Benjamin Hardy, is you grow by who, not how. By finding people that you can put into their highest and best use, you can grow. Because the how, the right who's will find. And I believe this with such certainty now in sales. It's the right who's, the right value system. They'll figure out their how. And that, that for me has been a massive le lesson in how we now scale. Alan Versteeg is the Global Chief Revenue Officer of Growth Matters. He's located in Johannesburg, South Africa. And you may see in this video some issues with the video or audio. So in that case, please bear with us because sometimes the internet is not completely stable. So I wanted to talk with Alan because of his experience with sales and building sales teams and training sales teams. In this interview, we talk about LinkedIn using OpenAI, um, AI in the sales process, where it belongs, where it doesn't belong. How do you build value with a prospect? How do you disseminate culture into your sales team so that as a founder, when your team is growing, you have the ability to make sure that they're going to continue to talk to prospects the way you did so that the um, value is established and therefore uh, the conversion rate will remain um, high, if not continue to grow higher. And uh, how to hire salespeople based on their values, not uh, a, a set of, of scripts that they should use, and a lot more. So I know you're going to like this interview with Alan. I know I did. So thank you for sticking with us. This is episode 175 as we've crossed, crossed our three-year mark. I look forward to bringing you many, many more interviews. So recently, LinkedIn decided that they were going to infuse OpenAI features into, I'm assuming it's LinkedIn Sales Navigator. I'm curious what you think about it. I'll wait to hear what you have to say, and then I'll say what I think. Yeah, I, I think with, and we can go to a broader conversation on AI later or generative language, you know, intelligent language, but I think the risk here is that what we're tending to see, and I'm going to go to the end of the game, we are downscaling the professionalism of sales, right? And I get that AI is a great assistant, but it should be assistant to artificial intelligence. And what I tend to see, Sean, is that what's going to happen is we're going to see more laziness and more ineffectiveness and more canned messages and more of the same. So now what happens is now I'm going to create a message a lot quicker, so I'm going to send out more of them. And effectively, the way I like to see it is, look, you suck. Now you can suck quick in front of more people. But the reality is when you think about LinkedIn, it's about connections. And are you connecting with people? And the way you connect with people is not through a connection. You connect by creating value. So if your intent is to create value and you're leveraging AI, I think it's a wonderful tool that you can leverage in LinkedIn. The reality is, though, for most people who struggle to even in a minute explain their value proposition, is they're going to use the tool to try and sound like they care about the customer as opposed to leading from a value of actually caring about it. And I think that's my key thing on anything AI. When your value system as a sales professional is to sell with noble purpose, you can leverage these tools to your benefit. If your intent is to be lazy and just see if you can get more over the line, then these tools are going to damage the reputation of sales professionals in the market. That's, that's my 10 cents on that, Sean. Okay. So I'll share real quickly my experience. I, I had a free trial for LinkedIn Sales Navigator, so I figured I would spend a month and try it out. I also have Phantom Buster. Uh, so I, I used LinkedIn Sales Navigator to create some searches based on a type of person that I wanted to reach out to. For example, uh, exit strategists, companies that are helping other companies prepare to sell their business. The reason being is the service that I've launched is to help companies cut their costs, right? Partific particularly companies that are grossing at least $5 million a year because their budget is high enough that I could save them at least a few hundred thousand dollars a year. Therefore, what I can earn is significantly enough to, to consider actually spending time on it. 
So I thought LinkedIn would be a great way to do it. I also considered email and all of these things. But in the end, I decided to go with LinkedIn because it's a lot simpler than setting up a CRM and setting up email automations and stuff that I've kind of have figured out how to do, but it took me a very long time to figure out. And it takes a lot of energy to actually set up. So that let me just uh, use Phantom Buster to take the search uh, results and export them to a CSV so that I can actually start to think about who from this list do I want to actually communicate with. And luckily, uh, it included the LinkedIn URLs and all that. Now, as you said earlier, it's very easy to use AI to craft messages and things like that. But I thought, I want to build human relationships with these people because I don't think AI is going to get the job done for something like this. And I had 5,000 people on that list. And if I were to send uh, you know, cold emails to 5,000 strangers and they were all interested or even 1,000 of them or, or 500 of them were interested in having a call with me, there's no way I could serve all of those calls. Now, again, these are, are, are referrals, not potential clients, right? My experience told me that when you're doing a consulting service that the best kind of uh, way to build your clientele is to... Uh, convince people that already serve that clientele to refer you to them because they are essentially transferring uh, the trust that the client has in them over to you. And so I decided to to try to build relationships with these exit strategists. So um, I decided to manually DM or, or you know request uh, a connection on LinkedIn with these people and then send them all DMs. Now the message is canned, but it's a custom message based on my understanding. So basically what I said to them was, hey, first name, um, you know, thanks for reaching out or thanks for connecting. I appreciate it. I'm curious, do you currently help your clients do a deep dive on their finances and do cost cutting for them in order to increase the valuation that they're going to get when they exit? Because some of them may, some of them may not. Some of them are financial um, professionals. Some are not financial professionals. Uh, some of them, you know, so they, there's differences in all of them, but I don't know what those are going to be until I talk to them. And so by asking a question, I'm getting them to share something with me to kind of break down the barrier. And I had some people completely ignore the message. Fair enough. That's going to happen. I had some people say, yes, I do that. Um, you know, I'm not looking, you know, we've got a team. We don't need your help. All right, fine. I had uh, one or two people already because I've only messaged like a hundred people or so. So it's like something I've just started. Um, one of them said, I'm not. I'm not looking for anything right now or like I'm not interested. And I responded, I'm, I'm not selling you anything. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. That's just my response to people that send me messages. And then she like reviewed what I said. And then we started to talk. Um, and then I had one person go, wow, I'm so glad you asked me a question about my process instead of trying to sell me something. And I was like, I'm here to try to help you help your clients. Why would I, and I'm not selling you anything. I want to get to know you. Right. So so my my desire is to build human relationships and I'm seeing that my process, even though it's slow and doesn't scale well, is what needs to be done in order to build kind of a referral network. Obviously, when you're trying to sell marketing services or whatever it is, these kinds of things that these agency providers have, then they're going to want to go far and wide and, and they're just assuming that most people aren't going to respond. But I want to build a few relationships with a few, you know, with a few people who are going to bring me clientele. So what I've seen is, um, you know, AI is, is not going to be useful for me. Could I employ it more in like the automation of, oh, this person sent me a message, tell Zapier to add them to my CRM, right? So there's things like that that I could do, but I've chosen to not do any of that for now because it doesn't make sense. So basically my, my understanding of open AI features on LinkedIn is it's going to make things worse than they already are. I think it'll be easier for people to one click generate messages that are completely useless and people will just continue to not trust strangers on LinkedIn. I think that's a key thing. And if, as I said, if you think about the idea of social networking and social it's mechanisms by which we connect um, and what I like about what you've been sharing and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm personally glad you didn't build a zap behind it, not because there's anything nefarious about it, but now, the reality is I think that we're forgetting is that when you're prospecting, when you're outbound, that effectively what you're trying to do is you're trying to treat the client up front like a client, not like a prospect or a suspect or a number or a data point. So I love the approach you took where you lead with a question because question shows curiosity, question says where you at, and questions normally allow people to quickly filter relevance. 
So immediately for you, you also don't want 195 people either saying yes or no or going down conversations you don't want to go down. You pre-qualify them in a way by adding value. Look, is this something you do? Sure. No, it's not something we do and we really struggle with it. Well, great. Let's have a conversation. What I loved in the story you shared as well, though, is the instinct for people to go, hey, look, I'm not interested. Hey, look, it's not happening. Um, I'm, I'm also starting to see some really good automated responses when people connect. Like, hey, um, I've got no context about why you want to connect N and N. If it is value, then do this, this, or this. Um, and so I know you're a real person. Do this. Right? So we're starting to see that, you know, it's almost like the technology is now starting to play against itself and going, how do we make this work? But it's not that the technology in itself is flawed. It has mechanisms to support us. It can, might, might help you take that question and articulate it in a way that is clearer to understand that your intent is better. And it can improve and enhance good intentions. The risk is, because it's so easy to do, I think it's going to have, it can easily have a negative effect. And I'll give an example of where we've, we've seen this before. We've seen this before with the advent of online calendars. You know, the ability now to hijack time in someone's day is so easy. The ability to, you know, set up a meeting for an hour is so easy, so we just do it. And the technology's intent is to make us more productive, but it makes it counter, it makes us unproductive because now it's so easy to set up a meeting, so we just set up a meeting. We don't think about an agenda. We don't think about what we don't talk about. We don't clarify, you know, what we need to do. So when you take that piece of technology, I don't think it's the technology that's flawed. I think it can really help us. But I, unfortunately, it's going to scale up the amount of noise and the amount of you know, crap that people are being sent via different social networks and, and further undermine the sales profession. Yeah, that's why I keep my events uh, hidden on my Calendly. And so when I have someone come to me that wants to be a guest, whether it's them messaging me directly or it's their PR agent, uh, the, I'll look at their bio first, like I did for you. And if I'm interested, I'll say, here's a calendar link for me to do an intro call. That intro call is 30 minutes. It used to be 60. I cut it down to 30 because if I can't figure out within 30 minutes, if I want to have an hour interview with someone, then then I'm not supposed to interview that person. And you're probably knowing the first seven minutes anyway. <laughs> the next 23 minutes is to be polite. Right. I will. So interestingly enough, what I've learned from sales is that the podcast is actually one of the best ways for me to create a sales pipeline because a lot of the guests are ideal clients because they're running seven and eight figure businesses. So by doing the intro call, like by, by doing the podcast, I'm creating free value. And by doing the intro call, I'm qualifier by, by looking at their bio, I'm pre-qualifying that there's someone I want to talk to, whether I'm going to pitch them the service or pitch them or, you know, referring me to their clients or um, just do a podcast with them. I'm pre-qualifying them by saying, look, you have to go through this. And then by doing the intro call, we can share kind of personality and see if we're a good fit to even do the podcast. And if it's someone that I want to do the podcast with, they're also going to be someone that I'd be willing to work with. And then doing the interview, we get to talk a lot more. You get to hear my story. You get to see the value and the way that I think so that when the podcast is over, there's potentially a chance to do another call where we can talk about working together. So I decide which guests I want to pitch the service to or uh, pitch partnership to or not pitch anything to. So it's, it's an inherent sales process without the guests realizing it's a sales process because I'm not selling anything until after... I'm not potentially selling anything until after talking with them multiple times over you know a period of time, whether that's a few weeks, a month, whatever. Um, so it's it's slow, but that's how people like to do business. Like, oh yeah, I've gotten used to this person. I've spent time talking with them. Yeah, you know, it, it's in the time you're talking, and I'm, I'm just reflecting on our journey, but in the time you're talking, people are either experiencing value or they're not. So one of the big perceptions or misperceptions I see with sales professionals is they think that value is only when the product or service is delivered. The reality is you, you are either adding or detracting value from the, the get-go. So even though their process is, as you say, slower, it's probably quicker than most sales processes, but the reason it moves forward is you get permission to move forward because you created a value, you didn't detract from value. When we're sending canned messages that detract from value, when we have an accelerated approach that detracts value, when we do that, then we don't get the outcome. And then we're hoping for that one in a hundred that might be relevant. 
With this approach, you don't have to go as wide. You can go quite narrow. You can get quite focused. You can be quite myopic in who you want on your show, who you partner with, as you've said. But the reality is across both parties, there's value. You know, if your guest is going, I don't need value from that call. They might say I'm not keen for the podcast or vice versa. And the reality is once we've established the foundation of value, the sale just becomes the next mechanism of value transfer. It's never the first mechanism of value transfer. You know, it's often the last mechanism of value transfer. And salespeople miss that. They're hoping that the customers will get value when they use, buy, or, or, or experience their product, service, or offering. The reality is they're assessing value in every single conversation and in the engagement. Um, and that's why I think, Sean, as you're saying, is that when you get to that later part of the sales process, you've actually accelerated the rest of the, of the journey because the value has already been established up front. And that's why it's about proactive outreach, not spammed mass outreach. Mm. Yeah, the I, I think you said something really interesting, which is the salesperson's just thinking about getting them to close and then have and, and have them feel the value in the service. Where I think when you have the founder of the company who's doing the sales, and even if there's another person on the team that's providing the service, the founder of the company is able to express value externally of the sale or the service itself so that the client or the prospect can see this person is passionate about this thing. They believe in this thing. They know that this thing can help me. And if they didn't think that, we wouldn't be talking. Now, there's some people that are less ethical who try to push a product or a service, even if it's not completely valuable for them. Um, but I, I think when you, as a founder, remove yourself from the sales process. If you don't disseminate that, that culture of providing value to a prospect, your sales team may struggle to hit the same kind of conversion rates that you could. I mean, it's the founder's dilemma. And I mean, it's, it's in part the reason we exist as Growth Matters. The reality is at a sales management level, we're asking conversations that have nothing to do with value creation. We're asking number-based conversations. We're asking data-based conversations. We're having uh, outcome-based conversations. We're not asking the lead factor conversations. You know, what specifically in the client's business do you think will change because they're working with us? Um, what specific value do you think they got from your initial call? Um, what do you think it was in our key white paper that they really stood out for them? We're not asking these questions. So when we work with large, you, you, you can't scale a global organization without a sales force, but you've spoken so true to the challenge, which is, why does an entrepreneur or founder not need sales training? It's because they have conviction. Conviction, they have clarity of their value. They have conviction of their value. That gives them confidence, and that confidence gives them competence. With sales, we think we can train the competence, and they'll be there. Competence is the end game. It's the ability to do something because there's some underlying things, and the underlying thing is the clarity, the conviction, and then the confidence. But when our conversations have nothing to do with the value we create for the market we serve, then how do you expect anything else but for salespeople to operate under the pressure of a quarterly number, of a ratio, of a um, of these things? And, I, and for me, it's an and, it's not an or. Yes, and we've got to look at the number. But when you step back and even speak to the founders, they go, geez, I, I see what I've done wrong here. I'm going, yeah, well, this is not a production line. This is humans speaking to humans. Let's also measure the value we're creating. Otherwise, the founder can't scale. And I've loved that you shared that, Sean, because so often I say is that, it's not a sales training challenge often. It's about understanding the clarity of our value and baking that in to how we operate as a business. And you've done it as a founder. You've done it instinctively, Sean. You've baked it into your process of you know guests and who you look out and how you reach out and what you do and the questions you're asking on LinkedIn when you're connecting. You know, these are things that are, when I say instinctive to you, they're instinctive because your baseline of conviction of your value proposition and clarity of the value proposition expresses itself that way. So when someone comes back and you and says, no, I'm not interested in services, and you go, well, I wasn't selling you, sir. I wasn't you selling services. They go, oh, gosh, okay, that's a bit, a bit of a breath of fresh air because I thought that's what you were doing. And, of course, you are, but you know that you have to protect them from the noise. You have to protect them from their own ignorance. You have value to add to them, but you're fighting in, a, in, a, in an ocean of noise. So what you do as a founder is you find that, that way to bring your gym forward. And even in my business as a founder, that's been the challenge, but even, even though we teach this. But now we've done that. We found the right who's that live by that system. We measure by that system because we all know the basics. You cannot but get rewarded if you create value for others. That, that's, that's the starting point. But we lose that when we get to a, a data-driven business and not a data and people-driven business. Hey, just give me 10 seconds of your time. 
I really appreciate you listening to the episode so far, and I hope you're loving it. And if you are, I would love to ask you to subscribe to the channel because what we do is a lot of work. And every week we bring you a new guest and a new story. And what we do requires so much love so that we can bring you something amazing. And every week we're trying really hard to get better guests that have better stories and improve our ability to tell their stories. So your subscription lets the algorithm know that what we're doing is fantastic and no commitment it's free to do and if you don't like what we're doing later on you can always unsubscribe and either way we would love a like if you don't feel like subscribing at this time thank you very much and we'll take you back to the show now mm, yeah makes sense I, I think there is definitely a huge danger for that um, and to be fair it it's not instinctive for me I spent years testing different things. I, luckily, I have a background in psychology, so I can take a step back at times and go, okay, why did that not work? Where some people who may have a marketing background may be looking at numbers and go, okay, the numbers say it didn't work. I need to change something where I can go, okay, that didn't work as a human. How can I say it differently? How can I do it differently? So for example, I'm working with a company now that's launching a, a headhunting firm that's meant to target AI talent only. and I'm teaching the founder about you know the sales process. We're going through the sales process. We literally did this yesterday, which is it's just the second of November when we're recording. And I had never thought of this before, but it came to me as I was working with him yesterday, which was we are trained to handle objections at the end of the call. What I decided to try with him was let's go through. So I, I have this like uh, logical phase, right? You ask them logic-based questions and then you get into emotional questions about how it would feel if this thing didn't change in your business. Why are you wanting to do this? Why are we the right people? Why do you feel we're the right people, right? So go from a logic to emotion back to logic where in that third section of logic, the goal is, is there anything that I haven't asked or is there anything that you haven't asked? Is there anything that you feel like is preventing you from understanding or, or wanting to work with me as a, as a provider, right? So get through the, is there, are, are there any objections to working with me specifically? Is it me and my business? Is there anything there? And if there isn't, then start to talk about the, the details of the process that you're going to provide, the service you're going to provide, the product you provide, what's the cost of it, what's the timeline to deliver, onboarding, those kinds of details. And when you're done with that, go back and go, and, and try to understand, is there anything that I didn't cover that you want to know more about? Is there anything that, you know, is, is going to make it harder for you to make a decision to work with us potentially? So in essence, you're, you're splitting the handling of objections between me and my business and the service. And I, and I'm curious to see how that works because I've never tried it before. Um, I'm curious to know if you have any experience or any thoughts on that, but I think that that will make it easier for any salesperson to be able to d discern where they're lacking in their ability to to convince the person or, or you know to, to work with the person. So, so one, I'm I'm interested to see what it comes back because I I know that it's going to be positive, and I'll give you my view on this. So, you know, if you take your psychology background, so at that point of decision making, there's this internal fight between the sacrifice for change and the cost of doing nothing. Right. So even when we built a strong logical case for change, there's still a sacrifice for change, right? And what most organizations then do is they say, well, you know, push forward and if there's objections, handle them. What I what I know works better, not not my not my view, it's you know, scientifically known in psychology, is you want to run what I call empathetic objection prevention. Meaning, if I'm about to partner with you, the better you could read my mind, the more I trust you. So if I said to you and I said, you know, looking at Sean, what I find in my experience when dealing with people in your role at this point is often some of their key concerns, kind of some of the key barriers they have that hold them from moving forward are normally this or this or this. Is that something you might be grappling with? So very similar to what you said, Sean, but I lead with the insight because I'm the Sherpa, I'm the trusted advisor, I'm the guider. So why would I wait for them to trip over that? Or why would I wait for them to say, because not everyone is extra, even, even with your great question, is going to say, well, Sean, it's you, and I don't, I don't like the fact that you came your head to the right. You know, no one's going to say what they're always thinking. But when you put it forward to them and they said, 
it's interesting. I actually wasn't I wasn't thinking about that, but that probably is what I, now what some people say is, oh, you've just created an objection. And I'm going, no, no, no. That's going to stop them from buying somewhere down the line. Now at least we can address it. And they say, yeah, oh, you know, that's been my major concern. So well, thank you for sharing. You know, the way we've held customers with that in the past is, and now I'm just guiding because that's it. And Sean, you know this. It's it's these two things. It's is if if common sense was common practice, we wouldn't we wouldn't have the struggles we had in the world, right? If theory gave us enough to act, we wouldn't have the challenges. The challenge is an internal psychological dialogue. There's a comfort zone. There's a homeostasis. There's a, a something I'm giving up in lure of the upside. And unless we aggress, that's something we're giving up. And so many organizations go, prevent, I mean, objection handling. Don't handle it. Initiate it. Be empathetic and say, look, what I found in my experience is these are the three things that stop people from acting. Is that what you're dealing with or is there something else that might stand your way? And sometimes they go, no, I actually think I'm good. I think I'm comfortable. Some will go, oh, you're actually right. One of the biggest challenges I face is how I'm going to sell this internally. It's one of the biggest things I have about how I influence this internally. He says, it's interesting you say that it's not just you. That's 80% of my bias. How we help them with that is, and now we're just adding value, adding value. So I love that you're experimenting with that. So your background in psychology, mine's engineering. So a lot of mine's also around, you know, there's got to be cause and effect. What's the cause and effect? But I'd argue that your approach one is, is solid. And obviously your years of testing of giving you that, giving you your instinct. Um, but objection prevention shows high empathy, which means instead of hoping they don't object, bring it out and say, hey, are you a little bit concerned about something? Good salespeople will read that in their cues. Um, but even if you're not great at reading cues yet, ask the question. What I found in my experience with customers at this point, some of the key barriers to moving forward have been this, although some of the ones you might be dealing with. And it's not can't. It's, 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 it's sincere, noble purpose that I want to help them address the resistance to change. Yeah, one of the things I was telling him yesterday was like, yes, let's create a script. And we're, I'm going to run mock calls with him where I'm going to present myself as specific avatars or specific prospects so he can get used to it. But I want him to be able to not need a script at all. I want him to be able to do what I'm doing right now with you, which like literally before we started recording, I said, okay, what's our topic? AI and sales. And then I said, oh, by the way, I read something about LinkedIn yesterday. And we're just having this completely fluid thing. And I have nothing prepared. I have no page on the screen I'm looking at. and and that's how any good salesperson is going to be. The goal is to basically interview the person that they're working with or that, that the prospect is you know, potentially going to work with them and, and get them to answer these questions in a way that you're building this rapport without making them feel like any part of what you do is can. They want to feel like it's natural. Like when you're on a date, when you're on a first date, you don't want to ask the same person the same questions every time. Because they're going to go, oh, you must have asked a million yeah, women. Well, you've, you've read the idiot's book to dating. <laughs> well, I haven't, but I, I, I mean, if that's a real book, then yeah, wow. But yeah. um, no, I, I have long understood that you know, sales and dating or, or business and dating are um, very, very similar. Yeah, and it, it speaks to it speaks to the intention again, right? So when you're dating, you have an intention for a relationship, and, and unless you're on a, on, you know, you have some, you know, short-term goal in mind, I won't go further than that. But generally, you're a relationship, you're trying to move that forward. But as you were saying to him about the script, that's so important, is the way I like to look at this is the metaphor of a chef, right? You've got ingredients, you have a recipe, and then you have the chef. And the same, the same ingredients and the same recipe present something different to different chefs. So when you're learning, the first thing you have to understand the ingredients of value. What is the actual value that we deliver? So as, you, as you're coaching this person, they're very clear probably as a founder, the actual value they bring. So the ingredients have to be rich first. The script is your initial recipe. It's when you're a little bit struggling, we'll take the conversation. He has a guideline. This is just your guardrails in terms of your conversation. But what eventually happens with any chef They've got the ingredients and they forget the recipe. They do a little bit of this and a pinch of that and they add this. It becomes very natural to them. And that's a natural sales conversation. But what often happens is not that the script is flawed or that scripting is bad. It's a good starting point to navigate conversations. But if you don't have the raw ingredients, you can't do it. The reason you and I can be, you know, let's call it unprepared for a conversation is because we have the ingredients within us. and We make up the recipe as we go. And that's where scripting helps. As long as the ingredients are solid value, the script helps as a starting point. 
but it shouldn't be, you know, only script because as you said, people want something that feels natural um, and is natural. And when my intent is right and my value is strong, my ingredients are strong, I will learn that recipe and improve it as we go. Can't argue with anything you just said. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, a really good analogy. And I just wish there were more people who are able to think of marketing and sales in terms of the human side rather than the number side. Um, although I, it, it took me ha forcing myself to learn more about the numbers and the conversion rates and these kinds of things to then take a step back and go, yes, those things are important, but the people are, are more important in a way. Cause as you said, um, being able to combine data and people, how do you get companies to, to kind of change the way they think so that they can combine those two and make them as important as the other. I think that's so important. And, and I love your curiosity for data. I, I share the same curiosity for data, but it's the curiosity of what the data is telling me. It's not that the data is the truth. So when you look at a conversion ratio, you're not going, our conversion ratio is wrong. We need to improve it. You're going, our conversion ratio is wrong. What's the root cause of that? What do we need to change in our behavior? And, you know, I'm going to give your guests a profound piece of advice. I say tongue in cheek, but, Never in the history of mankind has a human behavior changed when you change a field in an Excel spreadsheet, right? So the reality is the data is data points, it's data sets, it's evidence. And as we get machine learning and AI and, and big data, all of these things add more insights. But the idea is not to drown the information, it's to find the insight. And the insight is what can we go do more of, less of, start doing, stop doing, that's going to shift the behavior. To do that, the number one thing I have to do in an organization, Sean, to change this, is I have to change the sales management conversation. The data is an input to the improvement. The data, talking about the data doesn't change the data. You know, Ellen, you, you're at 10, you're 90% of your target. You need to be at 100% of your target. I believe in you, go make it happen. It changes nothing. I've got to coach Ellen on what those mechanisms are. And, and if you don't change the sales manager conversation, you don't change the sales conversation. So then you can't but expect the salesperson to be pressured, pushy, um, um, what, what I call clinically correct, so they're the perfect pitch, the perfect story, but they're not making their own meal. And the buyer reads it. I mean, we all know when we're on a canned call, right? And generally, short ironically, it's because it doesn't start with a question. It doesn't start with a simple question. You know, like with ours, it's I've recently worked with people like you in industries like yours who've been trying to achieve this but struggling to because of this. Is that something that's relevant to you? Just no, it's not relevant to me. Okay, great. Thank you for your time. It's not relevant to you. If it's relevant, those things would have triggered in you. You said, well, that's not actually my problem. Oh, my problem is this or whatever it may be. But why? I mean, there's this new concept. It's ironic, Sean. It's called human to human selling. I'm like, who's been asleep at the wheel? This is what selling is, right? And this is not just selling. I mean, in your world, exit strategies, you're selling the value of the business. A new venture capitalist, you're selling the value of the business. Uh, removing costs from a business, Sean, you're selling the trade off you're making by removing the cost. We're always selling. But what we don't realize is that we, we're doing it because we understand the intent and the purpose. Why then, when we're trying to take it to market, do we can it and try and scale it like a production line? Because the way you sell, Sean, the way I sell is going to be different. But we often have the same ingredients. We have intent. We have the right value we want to deliver. And then we start to adapt our recipe for what works for me. Right? But what we've tried to do, in, in specific in large global organizations, if we have a sales process, it's predictable results. And in reality, we remove the human element. The sales process is a guardrail of stages. It's the recipe. It's not you have to, I mean, I don't know about you, Sean, but you follow the recipe exactly right. It doesn't look like the picture in the book or the, or the, or the picture on the blog, right? Because there's something unique that person brings to it. And that's what sales is. It's a human-to-human -human interaction that can be improved through data, can be improved through technology, can be improved through those insights. When we don't make the data the master, and that's, that's a metric to improve because the only reason we should measure anything is to change it. We shouldn't measure something to talk about it because it doesn't change it. It's just a measure. Okay, great. What do we do about it? And I think that's where your curiosity to the data and your psychological background have come together so well where you're doing these things what I call instinctively well because you've seen the data, you've done the trial and error, and you've asked the right questions, which is what is the human factor in this? Let's figure that out. And that's the shift. Whenever we're selling, let's just remember that other person is a human with their own noise in their head and their own challenges and their own imposter syndrome and their, their own mother-in-law that drives them mad. You know, it's, we're humans.
that's what makes it such an amazing career to be in sales. So what are some questions that are your go-to when you're talking with people? Because I know I have some, but uh, I'm curious to see if there's anything I, I haven't thought of. Yeah, look, I think it, it, it depends where you are in their, in, in their buying process. I mean, obviously it depends. I mean, I find one of the strongest ones that really opens up a conversation. All right, great. You've shared with me some of your problems. You've shared with me some of what you're doing. What I'd really like to understand is what would you expect to change in your business as a result of partnering with us? And let's say I'll use my business. I go, oh, no, no, we definitely want to, you know, get our sales managers developed. I said, no, but that's what you're buying. I need to understand what are you hoping will go up or down or in or out, sustain or improve as a result of the partnership? Because if we can understand what success looks like, we can figure out how we get there. And that opens up such a wonderful conversation because many times they knew that going into it, but then they got so supply orientated, they're now talking about the product that we sell or the service that we offer. They forget the reason. So the power of that question. So as a partner to you as an exit organization, what specifically in your, in your customer's business do you think will change as a result of them working with us? Well, you know, we just need some more help around that. Yeah, but that's what you're buying. What is it exactly you're wanting to go up or down or in or out? It's such a wonderful conversation opener because we don't ask these things, right? Oh, no, I want to go to gym. I want to sign a gym membership. Okay, what are you specifically hoping will change as a result of you joining? Well, you know, I just, I just want to get healthier. Okay, well, what does healthy mean to you? Well, you know, I'm just going to lose weight because obviously being overweight is not healthy. Yeah, oh, that's part of it. But, you know, the scale is the fifth most important thing you should look at. There's four other things. What do you think your blood pressure is currently? Oh, no, I don't really know. Okay. And do you think Jim could help in that? And you can see where I'm going. This is real noble intent. I'm not a spin doctor. It's because I want to know what you're actually trying to move, and I want to educate you on what should move. So, Sean, if you think about some of your clients, they don't know what moves because your expertise in knowing how to cut those costs in a, in a way that doesn't um, derail the business growth is a skill. But they don't know how to look for. So when you say, well, do you think it would be important for this to go? Oh, yeah, no, that's a good thing. And that's where we start to move from demonstrate to educate. So that's a great go-to question. What specifically in your business will change? I teach sales managers to always ask that question. And sales managers say, oh, no, that's a great conversation. Perfect. What specifically in their business is going to change as a result of them working with us? And sales people normally go to product or service. They're going to buy this. No, okay, that's what they're buying. What are they hoping will change? So that, that's one of my definite go-tos in terms of a, a wonderful conversation opener. So you aim to to teach them something on the call to demonstrate the value of working with you. Well, you need to because if you're not demonstrating value in the call, then you um, I'm going to use this loosely, but then you're selling. What I mean by that is you're trying to get to the sale, not become the sale, the outcome of creating value in the conversation. See, because the sale is a byproduct of the value you create in the conversations. And if you think about what you do, you bring people on podcasts, you give them a voice, you share insights. There's a bunch of your experience that you're sharing long before they buy your services, right? So by understanding what they're trying to change, I want to bring insights into that. I want to bring value into that. I want them to think, this is the guy I should be speaking to. And they can't do that when I'm just going, okay, great. So you're going to buy our service. Wonderful. I want to ask them what they're actually trying to get out of it. And that's a noble question. I'm interested in the impact you're looking for, not just the product you want to buy. Is there anything I haven't asked you so far that you feel like we should touch upon? Um, I don't think there's anything you've asked me, but it's things, something that's, uh, you know, as with anything in our lives, as we read books and we at certain points, you read the LinkedIn article yesterday, so it feeds the conversation. I think what's important for everyone in a sales world or in a persuasion world to understand is that people analyze your values, not your behaviors. What I mean by that is values trump value. When you sell with noble purpose, when you're really curious, when you can create new solutions, when you tactfully challenge back, you know, it's not customers always right, because then what value do you bring? I hear that you say that, Sean, but I found something different in my experience. That's, that's, that's your purpose, because you come from this place. And there's a wonderful book called Selling with Noble Purpose, um, Lisa Earl McLeod, I think it is. But she's got the data, because you're you, you like me, you like data, the evidence that the top performing earners in sales in the world sell with noble purpose. You can't predict their personalities. You can't predict them by sales process. You can't predict them by methodology. What you can see is aligned values. That's the difference. So if, you, if you're if you in any role and you say, but I'm not really a salesperson, well, forget about that title because Hollywood doesn't do a great job of portraying us as professionals. But what I am is I'm a value creator. 
because I sell with noble purpose. And that difference, when you realize that your values are your differentiator, will take, and I see this a lot in, in your world, Sean, with founders, who kind of are almost fearful of the sales world, yet they built this business. It's because when they were out there talking, they didn't have the gift of the gab. And by the way, the only difference between extroverts and introverts in sales success is 0.03%. So let's just debunk that myth. There's no difference in whether you have the gift of the gab or whether you're silent. But what it is, it's a value system. And as long as you got that, man, you can take your ideas, you can take your business in the world, you can take it to venture capitalists, you can do what you do. That's available to anyone when the value system is strong. And that's why I say to people, don't focus on the gimmicks, focus on the essence and the essence of those values. So that's something I'd like to share, not really a, a, a question, but I think it's a valuable insight for people to kind of remove that identity of sales as this manipulative world and actually look at the data. And it's that the top performers is a value system of serving that leads us to sales success. So basically, don't look for someone's ability to talk. Look for, for the values when you're hiring someone that you may have to train. So it, it's better to hire someone who may have no sales experience if they have the values for it, because you can always teach them about how to provide the value, how to hone that value. Without a doubt. And they will instinctively, as you have through trial and error, learn through that process because you're in your growth mindset, your curiosity and your intention drive them. Because when you're trying to create value for a customer, you're going to learn. Because you know, Sean, you, you, you don't get to a point where I am a sales professional and I'm done. The reason I always say sales professional is professionals practice. Lawyers practice, doctors practice, salespeople practice. We never arrive. We're always practicing. So it's, that, it's exactly that. It's those values that will actually accelerate their growth. But what we think is we think we can take a performer, we can can a methodology, and we can make everyone that person. And they're still, with all this history of data, no evidence that we move the bell curve on sales when we only train methodology. Methodologies are tweaks to a good values system. What's the most important thing you've learned in life so far? There is something called the serenity prayer that says, grant me the courage to change the things I can, the ability to accept the things I can't, and the wisdom to know the difference. And there's two things in that. One, I think the wisdom to know the difference is the lifelong learning, right? And the biggest learning I had to learn, it's actually a book by Dr. Benjamin Hardy, is you grow by who, not how. By finding people that you can put into their highest and best use, you can grow. Because the how, the right who's will find. And I believe this with such certainty now in sales. It's the right who's, the right value system. They'll figure out their how. And that, that for me has been a massive le lesson in how we now scale. Because often you're caught up in your own head and, uh, you know, if I want it done properly, let me do it myself. And as a founder myself, how do I 10x my business? And then what I do is I create people and I try to overmanage the process and I micromanage. And I do contradictory everything I've just shared with you, by the way, on this, on this podcast, is I focus on the process and the numbers and the data. I don't go, wait a minute, let me get the right who, let me give them autonomy, purpose, and reason. Let me give them some guardrails. And then you know what, let me trust that's going to happen. Because the fact that I think that I can control outcomes is outside of my circle of influence. I can control what happens today. I can't, you know, I couldn't predict that my marriage was going to end. I couldn't predict that, you know, whatever happens in your life, you can't predict these things. So I had to learn that it's the wisdom of knowing the difference that is the lifelong lesson because we can sometimes hold on too long. That would be my view, Sean.